Hello you memory marbles. So the main problem with education system is that they tell you what to study but they most often don't tell you how to study the content that you have to be memorized and learn it. Um, they might hit on some of the space repetition system but they are mostly not that efficient. So here I managed to combine all the scientific studies and I tell you them to be more efficient when you're studying. But before you dive deep into the content, make sure that you check these two playlists after this video. I've got lots of memory related content in those playlists. So hopefully at the end of this mind map, you'll be able to identify different types of memory, these scientifically proven factors in formation of memory and learning mechanism, utilize learning hacks in your personal life, use these tips to facilitate the teaching process of any content to anyone in your life. All right, so I, I make sure that your brain size would definitely increase by 50% and we are not going to be like this because machine learns, but we have to be, we have to hustle for it. All right, so in this video, we get to study these two parts, but in following videos, we study memory and learning from different perspectives to be able to exploit this knowledge whenever we are trying to learn anything. All right, so let's get to the definition of memory. Um, so there is this detail, a small brain definition. They don't even pronounce it correctly, but we get to the colossal brain type. And so if you know, you know, man, I mean, it's memory. What do you expect to happen? Oh God, okay. And so why do we need to learn this? Because obviously we want to be more effective and be more productive. So the main idea is what you're trying to study, learn it really good in that one session that you're having. And hopefully when you utilize the space repetition system, this efficiency stays the same. All right. All right. So let's go to the different types of memory. If you take a look at it, we have sensor memory, working memory and long term memory. And the order of us is like this. So I took this image from crash course. All right. So we have external events. They go to your sensory memory, they get encoded to short-term memory, then they will encode to long-term memory and whenever you need them, they will be retrieved and they are in your short-term memory until you want to use them again. All right. So let's take a look at the sensory memory. We have five types of sensory memory. We have haptic, will you touch? We have echoic, what you hear. We have iconic, what you see. We have olfactory, what you smell and we have gustatory what you taste all right and each part of these activate different parts of your brain so whatever you're trying to learn if you involve all of these sensations you're actually involving more parts of your brain and you're facilitating the learning process that's actually the first tip that you have to have in your mind all right so let's go to the working memory working memory or short-term memory i mean there is a long term, long explanation of this, but basically it boils down to this that working memory is more advanced. If you're doing working memory, that means you're executing on a task, but short term memory is a part of working memory, right? So, this short term memory or working memory has four components. These components are central executive, phonological loops, visual spatial sketch pad, and episodic buffer. So, in central executive, your brain, a specific part of your brain, is coordinating the activities of other subsystems. It allocates attention to a specific task. It doesn't store information itself, but it manages to manipulate information from other components. So it's like an evil overlord. It just controls different parts of your brain. All right. And so the next part is a phonological loop. Phonological loop. A storage of sound based information. So basically, it's the beatboxer of your brain. It's the DJ Khaled. So it also has two parts. One of them is phonological store. This is stores the auditory information. The other part is articulatory process. This part is responsible for rehearsal, repeating a verbal information to keep it in the phonological level. It's like when you listen to a Taylor Swift song and you just keep repeating it in your brain until you just get brain fried. All right, so this was phonological loop. Let's go to the visual spatial sketch pad. 
If you want to define it, it is the temporary storage and manipulation of visual and spatial information. It helps to navigate and manipulate mental images. It has also two parts. The first one is visual cache. This is stored the visual information, all right? And another part is inner scribe. This part deals with the spatial and movement information, all right? It's like where you are going and what you're doing. The last part is episodic buffer. It serves as a temporary storage system that inter integrates information from different sources, such as the phonological loops, visual spatial sketch pad, and long-term memory. So in this place, your long-term memory is being mixed with your short-term memory. And that's it. These are four components of working memory. So the mom so actually one of the reasons that we call it working memory that is you're know, working on something, we're manipulating information. All right, with the central with the central executive, and we're mixing it with the long-term memory in the episodic buffer and other part of the memory. All right, so there is a model for this. It's called the Badly model from this paper. It's good, but it's not complete. It just gives you a sense of which which parts is are involved in this working memory process. But the main problem is that the influence of other factors on working memory, such as age, emotion, caffeine, hormones, and brain injury or diseases, which may modulate or impair working memory performance and functioning in different ways. All right. So it doesn't include these variables. But it's a good model. It's considered a good model to give us a hint on what's going on. All right, so these were short-term memory. Let's go to the long-term memory. What do we have here? So long-term memory is basically divided into two sections, declarative memory and non-declarative memory. Declarative memory, also called explicit memory, you're conscious about these memories. Hippocampus is involved in this type of memory. We get to that in a second. Autobiographical memories are part of this, and a really cool, quick example of it is facts and shape. So the other part is non-declarative, it's implicit, you're unconscious about it, hippocampus is not involved in it. Um, an example of it is like skills, different skills that you attain. Alright, so let's go to the declarative memory. So the definition is explicit memories are conscious memories or events, facts, things, personal lens. Autobiographical memories are memories related to yourself, for example, what happens to me today, it's only me, and it, this type of memory is uh, divided into two parts, episodic memory and semantic memory. Episodic memory is events that happens to you, like it event, but semantic is general knowledge of the world. For example, what's the shape of this object? But the event is, okay, what I had for lunch today. All right, so let's go to the non-declarative memory. There are four types of it. The first one is procedural memory, like walking, cycling, and driving. All right, so you're, so you're unconscious about this stuff. You're unconscious about the walking, but you know how to walk. You learn how to drive, but when you're driving, you're, you're some kind of unconscious about it, or you're unconscious about cycling. So it's, it's, it's like a skill. So then the next part is associative memory, like me linking memory, like the ultimate mental Tinder. So what does it mean? It, it links memories together. For example, look what I've done here. I'm linking this image with the image of Tinder with the concept of associative memory. All right. So I'm exactly doing the same thing that your brain is supposed to do. So this is actually help the process of remembering what is the associative memory. All right. So here, let's go to the next part, non-associative memory. Involve changes in strength or efficiency of a single stimulus response pathway. So what does it mean actually? It's like your brain way of saying, been there, done that. Yeah. And a good example of it is, um, if a person live in, in a near a busy road, they may be less aware of the noise of traffic after a period of time. Basically, you're getting used to the environment. All right, the next one is priming. It is experiences influences a person's behavior. All right, so let's take a look at the example number one. Being more likely to use a word you heard recently, right? 
It is in your long-term memory, but you're actually priming it. You, so you, for example, you know the meaning of a vocabulary. You hear it a few times in someone else's speech, and whether you want it or not, you use that type of vocabulary, that type of language in your speech. All right. A second example. So a smoker might crave a cigarette after a meal. I mean, if you get used to smoking after a meal or if you get used to using drugs after failure, it's actually really harmful. We should be really uh, aware of it when this is happening. All right. All right. So let's talk about the hippocampus. We, we talked that uh, this declarative memory the in in declarative memory hippocampus in, is involved and in non-declarative memory hippocampus is not involved where is it actually it's not like your computer where you go to save a file you don't know where it is no no we actually know it is hippocampus is here but the interesting part is these long-term memories are here for a small period of time for a short period of time but after a while it the your long-term memory just get propagated to other parts of the brain and it will be exactly like this your computer we don't know where it is saved but your brain does and you certainly do but we don't know if we examine it and so if you want to take a look at an apps a graphical abstract for this declarative and non-declarative memory you can see which so we can see which parts of the brain are involved in which type of these long-term memories in summary we explored various types of sensory memory delved into the four components of working memory and highlighted the two major groups within long-term memory, each linked to a specific part of your brain. If you're aiming for an efficient learning process, incorporating all these memory types is key. Wondering how? We'll break it down in the next video.